Hey folks, welcome to the next great interview on the mind of a skeptical leftist. This time around, I want I talk to Anarch of the YouTube channel of the same name. It's a great chat, and I think we cover a lot of ground about what a state is and why anarchists have a truly comprehensive understanding of it. Uh, we also cover a little bit about why some Marxists don't seem to have as good a handle on the state or even all of Marx's writing. I know I'm not an expert, but uh, Anarch certainly has a a very good grasp on the subject and has done a lot of reading on it, so I defer to him quite a bit. Uh, as with all discussions, I learned a lot, and while I enjoy talking to any and all leftists that aren't awful, uh, there is something about talking to other anarchists that really helps me feel like less alone in this giant dark hellscape of capitalism that we live in. Um, <laughs> so. Besides that, I don't really have anything for a pre-show uh, this time around, so I'm just going to send you over to the interview. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm speaking to Anarch. Hey there. Good Thanks to be here. Me. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess uh, you've been doing a YouTube channel for a couple of years now. I wonder uh, what kind of got you started there. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I've I've been uh, into politics, I guess you'd say, since about 2011. Uh, I was sort of radicalized by the 2008 financial crisis, and uh, it seemed to me that you basically producing content in a way which was. Um, uh, easy for people to consume, or rather, it was the place where they were consuming content, uh, was uh, a good a good vector for radicalization to spread radical sure. ideas and to uh, uh, to hopefully expose more people to anarchism. Yeah, it's a uh, the nice thing I found about uh, your videos and uh, many videos on the, on YouTube is that like they have like a deep theoretical knowledge. They can help kind of break things down in a way. Uh, in fact, yours specifically is is quite uh, quite good in that sense. It helps it to be easy to understand. Well, I'm glad it achieves that. Uh, sometimes I worry that I I dive uh, too deep and uh, people are their eyes are glazing over. But you know, I'm I'm appealing to a, a niche audience, perhaps you might say. Uh, <laughs> well. Yeah, I suppose. I, I'm, I'm trying to create a variety of resources such that it kind of pipelines people in and then and then reroutes them to different videos. And but uh, but I have a tendency to to go pretty deep, I guess you'd say. Yeah, which I guess explains why your videos are often over an hour long. <laughs> yeah, the next one is no exception. It'll be almost two hours long. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. I. I could talk shop and ask questions about like your process, but that's probably not what people want to hear. So <laughs> I'd be willing to answer any questions you got, of course, if that's what you want to talk about. Let, let's go. Right now. <laughs> well, this show is for leftists, not uh, podcasters, right? So <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So I guess one of the things that I really wanted to ask you about was uh, the concept of the state. I have a friend who is, uh, he, we do book reviews on this channel. Uh, it's, he's a Marxist Leninist. He does, he has a view of the state in such a way that he often, he thinks anarchists have kind of a superfluous, superfluous type definition of the state. Mm. And I'm wondering like, do we have a concrete definition of what the state is and how does that translate into, uh, what we're doing? Well, I think the anarchists are the ones who have like a materialist and historical definition of the state. Um, I think Marxists didn't really concern themselves a lot with understanding the state, didn't write about it very much, didn't do a lot of analysis, partially because Marx himself didn't do a lot of analysis of the state. He had planned on doing so, but he died before he really got around to writing that work. Um, right. The reason why anarchists mostly wrote about the state was because that was the place the two schools of thought really uh, disagreed. So what they really disagreed about, though, was was um, how to define it. 
in a real way. That was what it came down to. Um, okay. And so that's the actual <laughs> divide in many ways. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. And I would say what ended up happening was in that dispute over how to define it, anarchists had to dive deeper and deeper, analyzing the real history of the state, looking at real anthropology, understanding how it actually functioned and how it intertwined with the rest of society. The, the Marxists tended to have a very economically reductionist understanding of the state. Uh, they basically mm -hmm. just thought that the state was was uh, only a mechanism for uh, enforcing class rule. And in Marxism, class is understand very narrowly through the relation to the means of production. So what that means right. is to them, the state is just an arm of the economy. And if you just redefine the economy, the state will just completely change its form and will be a radically different thing. And then, oh, if the workers are in control, then the state uh, the state will just be a thing that is under control of the workers because they're now the ruling class. Um, right. the, the anarchists always when this originally when this dispute was happening would point out this is not a very good definition of the state. Um, mm. This isn't really very coherent. It doesn't really match what happened when the state arose, how the state arose, and how it actually relates to the rest of society. The way the anarchist sees it is the state is, is that entity by which the masses are alienated from the control over the civic functions of society. It's, it's right. essentially the way that their ability to defend themselves is taken away, that the decision making over all rules and governance in society is taken away from them. Uh, uh, it, it's essentially a centralizing force of monopoly over the civil functions of society. So this came from a historical analysis, understanding how the state actually arose in fact. And what we've seen now is over the last 150-ish mm, years, the anarchist has just been repeatedly, uh, uh, you know, verified. It's just, right. it's, it's, not only in that all of the things that the anarchists said would happen if the Marxists saw it in this way, all of it was perfectly verified down to literally their predictions came true in a way which is like startlingly accurate. <laughs> like they basically said exactly what would happen in the USSR, uh, you know, right. decades before it ever took place. And they also ended up being correct, the more anthropology and history that we have now recovered about how the state really did arise and what function it actually served as it did arise. So I would say at this point, if one is being a sheerly a scholar about these two definitions and understandings, the anarchist's definition is the only game in town. So I, I wonder like, okay, so if the state is that, that tool that controls the, uh, rules that li people are living by essentially uh how does how does one eliminate that without eliminating those rules well i would say what the state is defined in that it has monopoly over those things that it uh, narrowly yeah. monopolizes that into the hands of a small group of people and that small group of people is often either is the ruling class for example if you go you know a ways back into the say monarchy that was the ruling class and in, if you, uh, you know, see how it works in conjunction with the capitalist, for example, it is uh, directly an arm of that of that ruling class. Right. But what you'll find is the state always ends up being this very narrow, centralized group of people. And to the degree where, you know, we could talk about, quote unquote, proletarian states all day long. But the only way a proletarian, even let's like concede the definition to the Marxists, right? Let's just imagine there's such a thing as a proletarian state. The only way that could ever happen is if the masses of the proletariat had direct control over all of those things. Right, that is to say, right. it would have to basically be exactly what the anarchists want, right? And unfortunately, what we see is that has never happened under any of their projects. They have never even gotten close to doing anything like that. What actually ends up happening is a very, very narrow group of people rule over the masses, create all the laws, govern over them, have monopoly over all violence, end up also having control over all banking and financial institutions. Essentially, this idea of the proletariat state ended up just kind of being a dream, not, not a reality. Right. It... it I think of it in, in like in terms of uh, representatives, right? Like we have representative democracy in U.S. and Canada, and but I mean 
if I, there's a figurehead running the country and they are supposedly the representative of the people, then how is then unless those people are actually influencing that person's rulings, then they don't have any control. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. And I would say this is why representative democracy doesn't work. I mean, it's one of the many reasons why representative democracy <laughs> doesn't work. Um, I think the problem is, is that no person can ever like, quote unquote, represent a mass of people. That's right. a nonsense concept. I mean, insofar as we're using these terms that get thrown around in the debate between Marxists and anarchists, that's actual idealism. You actually believe in this like transcendent idea that a person can quote unquote represent millions of people. Nonsense, yeah. complete nonsense. <laughs> um, but, but what also a problem is when you use this representative system, you end up with a situation where if the wrong person sits in that seat, it just becomes a massive failure mode. The whole structure just explodes, basically. Right. And this is, of course, they it, call this revisionism or, you know, like, <laughs> and it's like, guys, why do you keep building a structure that has a failure point that leads to, quote unquote, revisionism? Stop building it this way. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway. It, yeah, if it's, if the way you're doing it isn't working, then you have to change the way you're doing it. Agreed. And I think that that anarchists have been accepting that, that they have failed with previous tactics now for their entire history. And they've been mm. adapting and changing. Like every two decades, you will see that there is a new, a new uh, uh, conception of praxis that arises in the anarchist movement attempting to ad uh, adjust itself to modern circumstances and to understand how to meet the hurdles as they arise. Um, uh, yet what I see within authoritarian leftist ideas is that they never adapt. It's the state every time. It's a vanguard. The vanguard just domineers the masses. It uses basically very similar methods each time with, with small tweaks. And then it ends up creating a very similar sort of state with a huge emphasis upon industrialization and uh, you know getting the buy-in of the proletariat while often exploiting, exploiting people who are involved in agriculture or, or in rural areas. And right. uh, ends up just really reproducing capitalism. Yeah. In, in your video, you kind of talk about how uh, even the Leninist version of uh, the state isn't really true to, say, Marx's uh, ideas. So I wonder uh, if you can maybe expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm mostly getting at the idea that Marx would have been speaking about a dictatorship of the proletariat. Right. Mm. So, like, I think that if we're just trying to be faithful to what Marx would be considering as our goal within the era we're in, it would be a dictatorship of the proletariat. And his conception of the dictatorship of the proletariat is an era wherein the proletariat have direct, unconstrained control and that they would be doing that specifically to suppress the bourgeois while uh, you know, at basically the various forces of reaction as they're going right. through this transitionary period. Now, what we see in the, you know, there's this, there's this uh, debate about what that, what that, what that is, what the DOTP is and what it means for a very long time. We've had that debate. The problem is, is we now know what it means because we have now found Marx's notes uh, as he referred to Bakunin's statism and anarchy. So we actually mm. know Marx's exact responses to Bakunin's criticisms about the dictatorship of the proletariat and the concept of a proletarian state, a proletarian state. And what we see is Marx essentially just goes, Bakunin, you're misunderstanding me. I, I essentially want exactly what you want. Uh, I want the people to be in direct control. I don't want these intermediaries. Uh, I'm not, I don't believe in that. Uh, I, I think that we have to have a situation where the people actually govern themselves and, and push the project forward themselves. Um, and what we can see is I think that Marx would not be pleased with state capitalism. Uh, this is, of course, everybody likes to claim Marx to their idea. But I of think course. I yeah. think if we read Marx by by his comments on, on Bakunin's work, we can see that if him and Bakunin had actually just been sat down in a room together and they had been able to work these little annoying terminological details out, that it is very likely that what Marx wanted, the dictatorship of the proletariat, is actually precisely what a lot of anarchists want. 
But right. but we're in this position now in the modern era where that word where that phrase has become so utterly bastardized, right? Where it's like when they say they want a dictatorship of the proletariat, they really just mean they want a regular old dictatorship. <laughs> and then they say it's of the proletariat afterwards, you know? And right. uh, that's sort of the problem, you know? Yeah, I know when I talk to uh, my friend Justin and other Marxist Leninists that I actually know, um, often it, it gets into like these, uh, we want the same thing. We just have different methods of getting to it, uh, kind of discussion. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the way it goes in practice. And it doesn't certainly doesn't seem to be the way that I encounter Marxist Leninists on Twitter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so where's the break there? <laughs> yeah, there's a few really weird things happening here. Okay. First, it should be said that if we're talking about kind of like the orthodoxy, then, then um, ostensibly, yes, we want the same end goal, a stateless, classless, moneyless society. But right. then there's also this weird thing where like on Twitter, you're talking to people and it's like, it's not even clear that that's even what they want, right? Like yeah, sometimes yeah. it's like, do you want a classless, <laughs> you know, stateless, moneyless society? It seems more like, in fact, it seems like they're constantly doing apologia for why that's not even possible, theoretically possible, right. because they're trying so hard to dunk on anarchists that they don't even they end up actually just making a bunch of counter arguments to communism, which is bizarre to me. That being said, that being said, you know, just in the, in the being the most charitable conceivably possible. Right. Just like looking at it like, well, OK, those people are charlatans. Push them aside. Right. They, they don't represent hey. it. Let's say that. <laughs> and let's say that, that that most Marxist Leninists or Maoists or whatever do want this this, you know, communism that we have in mind. You know, the free association of free producers and all of that from each right. according to their ability to each according to their need. Um, what really ends up being the conflict is that they don't have a conception of means ends unity. Right. So the anarchist is the anarchist theory is predicated around this concept that you cannot disentangle the means and the ends. You cannot right. practice you cannot practice means which are utterly contradictory to your ends and hope that your ends will come out of them. Right. Um, right. You can't practice dictatorship and hope to reach communism. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nonsense. They're, 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 they're diametrically opposed concepts. One is the hyper centralization of power, the cult of personality, the utter robbing of the people of any control over their lives. And, and with the, the same old liberal justifications that, oh, we're a representation of you. You have to be dominated in order for everything to go well. If we didn't dominate you, you would just be, you know, stupid, lazy brutes. Open that to attack. Do <laughs> yeah, it, just so it sounds like the same old shit just now with, a, with new aesthetics. And right. so what the anarchist says is, no, you have to have means that are consistent with your ends. Now, this is where I would say we actually get a dialogue, right? If, there, if, somebody can, if somebody can walk themselves down the path this far, where we can actually have a talk at this stage of development and nuance, the question then becomes, what is the sacrifice that must necessarily be made of our means to achieve those ends? Right. That's mm. that's the challenge at hand. And I feel like the unfortunate truth is that they don't even want to have that conversation. They just want to default to the answer being screw it, make the most powerful authoritarian state you conceivably can and just hope it becomes communism. And if you have any criticisms, you're a naive idealist anarchity. Learn historical materialism. <laughs> right. Like right. like that's that's yeah. that's what it comes down to. And then, you know, sometimes the anarchists can be can overcorrect the opposite direction where they go, no, absolutely no power structures. Organization is bad. It's it's, you know, stultifying and, and it gets people too stuck in these things. And if we got means ends unity, why are you creating organizations? Shouldn't it be the free association of free producers? And it's like, OK, clearly <laughs> there's a compromise here. But if you're asking me, the compromise is far more in the direction of a social anarchism than it is in the direction of a hyper centralized state pretending to represent the proletarian. Right, right. Like uh, we want we'd rather have smaller groups of people freely associating, but with a similar goal than, say, uh, a vanguard party that <laughs> takes over the state and uh, yeah. leads the revolution. 
Yeah, I mean, taking over the state is a, is a really is is just a totally a failed praxis at this point. Is if I'm just being frank, you know, like right um, to the degree where even back in the time of Lenin, Lenin said that taking over the state was was a was a waste of time. You know that he, even he said uh, you have to smash the state machinery and create something anew. Essentially, um, you know, the Bolsheviks saw themselves as interests. They didn't see themselves as like wanting to win a majority and then govern over a, over a liberal republic. You know, they were <laughs> they were trying to build a mass worker movement and and uh, over and destroy the previous state and put a new one in place. Unfortunately, what we find is that if you don't have any conception of prefiguration, the building of dual power, then all that really happens is nobody has really learned how to live in a new society yet. You just basically right. come to them and you go, okay, you guys have been doing these really awesome insurrections. You've been kicking ass with these unions and everything. Uh, now I'm going to need you to ha learn all at once how logistics, supply chains, uh, doing being a technician, uh, uh, you know, doing all forms of administration and management, governance, writing legislation, wielding power, functioning as, as confederated militias. You just need to figure that all out on the spot. And what we find is that's not possible. That's not how, that's not how that works. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the uh, statist solution to that was to be like, well, I guess we're going to have to keep the state. Then uh, we just basically got to put everything back in place as it was and just hope this tiny little vanguard is enough to push it all forward with their super powerful class consciousness. Right. Whereas the anarchist said, uh, that clearly didn't work. So what we need to do is we need to prepare people people for that world within within the circumstances we currently have. Not right. just hope that repeating this with red aesthetics is going to fix the problem, but instead begin building the counter system within the belly of the one that currently exists. And uh, I would say this defines the modern era of, of anarchist praxis, uh, this concept right. of dual power building, the construction of a counter system. For sure, especially considering like we're, it's starting to feel like the system we're in anyway is in a collapse state. So uh, it actually presents more opportunities to build that dual power as long as, alongside that collapse. I agree. Um, in fact, I think one of the things that we really need to do is be seizing the um, the vac. Mm, excuse me. We need to be seizing the vacuums that the failure of the system has created. Right. Right. Um, now, there's a perverse incentive in all of that where you almost want the state to fail so you can seize the vacuums. But <laughs> right. but it's also kind of this thing where at this point, I feel like especially if you're like in the US, for example, you don't really have a choice. OK, the right. state is continually failing us like we try. Listen, people tried the whole Bernie shtick. OK, they tried it two times yep. in a row. OK, we yep. it didn't work and, and, and it's not going to work. So at this point, what we need to be doing is asking ourselves, how do we actually meet the needs of the masses? And while we're doing it, how do we do it where it's not a charity model, but we are actually building the ability to meet these needs consistently and for the masses? Because that's right. the real key that has to be found. And, and if we can answer that question, we will create a mass movement out of these dual power projects. What we really need is more commitment to that. We need more people to abandon this 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 electoral project that really doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And we need people to stop trying to be vanguards who want to dominate everyone and instead begin asking ourselves, how can we build dual power? How can we fold the masses into our project? How can we be a truly democratic movement that builds the counter system and proves that an alternative is actually possible? Yeah, it's a that's a big question. Like, uh, <sighs> I don't know uh, exactly you know, like the, the the place where you are, but in Saskatchewan here, uh, I have trouble convincing people that you know other people deserve to be you know prisoners in jail deserve to be alive. <laughs> like I have a lot of trouble just convincing people of basic human rights. So it, it seems, I mean, I still believe there's hope, but <laughs> it, it makes it seem quite daunting to convince people that anarchism. Uh, or a dual power system is even possible. Yeah, I think th that step one is you just have to start building. Um, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I don't know okay. how much I don't know how much anybody in Canada knows about the different states in in the United States, but I'm just going to tell you it's one of the reddest Republican voting states in the entire United States. 
Um, that being said, it has a very strong counterculture, which is which is good. Um, there are a lot of opportunities here, and and the, the, this state itself is also failing the people in a, in a, in a truly a cat- catastrophic manner. Right. But um, the way I look at it is, I'm not waiting around to convince the masses. Um, mm. I'm 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 immediately asking myself. Who are the people that are here that are willing to begin building that counter system now at whatever scale is available to us? Right. And what I've found over the years that I've been doing this is that building the example is, is priority number one. And that if you can build the example, people will begin to be radicalized by it. People are mm-hmm. radicalized by seeing the possibility in front of them. Okay. It's like, this uh, I'm, I'm part of two groups and I'll shout them out here because one of them asked me like, Daniel, why do you never shout out our groups? I'm part of Cooperation <laughs> Tulsa, which is part of Symbiosis, a, a, a communalist and social ecologist network. And I'm part of Scissor Tail Anarchist Organization. But what I want to say, the example is specifically about Cooperation Tulsa. And that is Cooperation Tulsa started with three people. Okay, three. And what we did was we just asked ourselves, what is our actual capacity and can't, what can we actually build with what we've got? And we began starting to do these projects where we actually started to collaborate, for example, with the uh, Vernon AME Church, which is a historically black church in the Greenwood District here in Oklahoma. I don't know if you know about the Greenwood Massacre, but that's a whole thing. Anybody watching? It sounds familiar, but... Go research the Greenwood Massacre. It's one of the most atrocious things you'll ever read in your life. Um, but like we, we, we partnered with them to create a garden, which would be controlled by the community to some degree. And what we found is that project like tripled our membership because, because what it did is it gave people a demonstration. This can happen Mm. that if you put the work in, these coalitions can be built, that there is the possibility to build a different world. And so what I think you have to do is. Act at, cap- at your capacity, not at, you know, some grand sweeping campaign. Right. Uh, you know, you don't you'll burn yourself out if you do that. And you then you have to start building the examples, show people that it can be done. That's radicalizing. I think that's uh, that's a good message. Like, yeah, <laughs> especially the do the small thing that you're capable of doing because it's, it can be very daunting to see things in a big picture way and like start, start wondering where the fixes are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think we're in a time right now where it's very challenging for people because everything seems really hopeless. Um, and we're in a situation where unlike the last revolutionary wave, we don't like have this massive, you know, radical union movement, right? Like, the last time that we came around to this 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 like global recognition that everything was screwed and that all of these states were in a were in a this moribund sort of you know coming out of the gilded age and all that falling apart there was a massive union movement that had already been built right this time we don't have that so people feel super hopeless. There's not really a place for them to look and say, ah, there is my outlet. And I think that the job of people who care, the job of people who really do believe in a revolutionary future is to begin building those outlets so that people actually have a place to go, to build these receptacles. Like, for example, George Floyd or the George Floyd protests, right? Yeah. Those, those protests were incredibly radicalizing for a lot of people. Okay. And what, what I'm, what I really think is that overall, you know, there were good and bad things that came out of all that. Mostly I'd say it was good. You know, I'm in support of nearly every single thing that ever took place. Uh, but I think the biggest good that took place was that it funneled so many radicals into organizations which existed. It brought so many people Mm. into the fold of wanting to organize. And what I think our job is, to some degree, is to create these organizations that will stick such that when the next George Floyd protest wave comes, there are orgs there that are ready to receive these new members and have examples and can go to those people and say, hey, Here's the way to struggle forth. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to give you a vision of a better society. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, 
I don't, I don't think I can add anything to that. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I've been thinking about this stuff a lot, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, how long have you, how long have you been an anarchist? Um, you know, it's like, I've been calling myself an anarcho syndicalist, like ever since like 2011 or 2012 or something, mostly because I got really into Noam Chomsky. Uh, oh, yeah. but, but how long have I been sort of a principled anarchist who has values that really align with anarchism? I'd say probably like the last six, five or six okay. years, right? Like I think before that, I had researched anarcho-syndicalism and I thought the CNTFAI was awesome. But I still had a lot of views which would have been maybe kind of more broadly libertarian socialist Maybe right. more like a libertarian municipalism kind of thing. I still thought that electoral politics had some value. Um, you know, I was, I was, I thought a lot about how do we fight for concessions from the state? You know, how can mm. we popularize those sorts of things? Um, right. The more anarchist theory I've read, the more I've, I've uh, 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 moved away from those positions. That's is fair. All I'll say. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I, I was on a, I guess timeline it was probably a similar path but i sp i pro sounds like i spent more time on like ayn rand objectivist type liber uh, voluntarism type stuff <laughs> and uh, that was a, definitely a dead end but <laughs> but uh yeah it's oh, the yeah. timeline seems similar yeah 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 that that stuff is not only a dead end because it's mostly just propaganda to help capitalism perpetuate itself without regulation, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. also because we don't really have a whole lot of examples of that ever happening. And in the no. examples we have where it did happen, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. It turned yeah. out very badly. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, I, uh, I've ended up in this position through struggle, through actually organizing on the ground uh, through reading history and and through reading reading theory, you know, and uh, and I found that the more I read, the more I study, the more I understand history, the more I organize, the more I recognize that the anarchists have had it m mostly right, ninety percent right for over a hundred years at this point. Right, and uh, and I think really the main thing I would say they were lacking was a concrete organizational program, which has been developed over the course of those hundred years. And um, a, a fully intersectional viewpoint, which I think they yeah. really, really still – some people still need some intersectionality. Yeah. There's, some, yeah, there's still sure. some problems, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, I saw somebody on Twitter said uh, – it was something about indigenous lands are not your uh, commons, quote unquote. And the backlash against that <laughs> was – I thought – incredibly ignorant and unwarranted. Like it's like the pushback against the land back movement, right? Like it's, that, that, it the, seems like those conversations are ludicrously uh, uh, complicated. And also the opinion you're going to get on any of those topics is going to differ largely depending oh, yeah. on who you talk to, you know, yeah. like uh, I organize with uh, a group that at this point I think is literally like half indigenous people. And all of them want the lands returned to the commons. They don't want the lands given over to the tribes. In fact, mm. you know, they see the tribes as, as having, you know, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat kind of being capitalist better by far than the, than the state, uh, either the, the local state or the federal <laughs> state. Um, right. and, and as, you know, not being like out and out enemies or anything, but like, you know, the goal for, for them is not to return these lands to, to, a a, a, a tribal state, but instead right. actually to, yeah, actually return them to the commons. Exactly. That's as it's said there. So like, yeah, this is, this is a big conversation. You know, what does land back mean? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Right. That's true. Yeah. That's um, and, true. and, uh, it's, it's a big conversation to be had and people really need to not flatten it. I think that's one of the yeah. problems that's taking place, right? A lot of flattening taking place, kind of similar to the conversation about black nationalism, where it's mm -hmm. like, well, 
first you need to talk about what nationalism means to you. What, what does nationalism right. mean? If you mean statist nationalism, well, yeah, that is incompatible with anarchism and libertarian socialism. But if all right. you mean is like nationalism insofar as that, you know, you're a dispossessed people, there is a diaspora which has unity of history and culture, and that you want to fight for the for the emancipation of that of that group and to bring them together and to create a, you know, a solidaric movement between them, that you want to recreate a sort of a sort of uh, pan-Africanism. And well, that's totally compatible with anarchism and libertarian socialism. But but people have a tendency to to not read anything, to not <laughs> talk with anybody, and to just right. pretty much just assume they got it figured out. They got they yep. got the whole thing figured out, beginning to end. This is the only way. <laughs> they're they're a monolith. Uh, all black people think like X. All indigenous people think like X. You know, it's like right. it's not good. I really would like people to do a little more research and a little more listening. That'd be nice. Yeah. A little more listening. <laughs> a little more listening. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I learned back when I was one of these, uh, I was actually kind of a conservative for a while and I believed I was more on the climate change denial side. And I learned through argument with a, a very good friend that I did not know as much as I thought I did. <laughs> so, so over the years I've tried to really adopt that as a, like an ethos kind of thing. Like I don't know as much as I think I do. So maybe I should be willing to learn from people. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like <laughs> this, this idea, uh, you know, w this uh, phrase we've heard, decolonize your mind kind of thing, right? Right. And, uh, a big part of that that should be taken into account is that like everybody has reactionary viewpoints that they haven't inspected. Everybody has ideas that they that if they said them out loud, people would give them the side eye like, whoa, dude, <laughs> what did you just say? You know, like. And I think that a lot of people would be so much better off if they stopped just saying those knee jerk opinions out loud and listened until they felt confident that they understood what the conversation sounded like. Um, because I used to be the person where I was like, oh, I have X stupid opinion. Somebody needs to disprove it. And like, you know, I'd go and just, uh, you know, get people confront people with it over and over and over and, and, and tell somebody could present a counter argument only then would I change my perspective. You right. know, I found that it's way better to just shut up and listen <laughs> until you understand. And then, you know, sometimes, so, for example, you know, the, the, the black nationalist conversation or the land back conversation, mm -hmm. um, you know, I listened until I realized that, oh, there's just a huge variety of different perspectives on these. And I do support this position and I don't support that position. Right. And I could, you know, we could have a discussion over that. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to try to homogenize these these struggles. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend they're just all one thing. And, yeah. and I just really feel like people could please just do that. Just listen, <laughs> just listen long enough that you're not essentially a reactionary, you know, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, that's right. When somebody says land back, don't just turn into a, no, oh, what are you going to do with all the white people? You're going to send us all back to Europe, <laughs> which is bizarre. Cause I don't think I've ever heard an indigenous person be like, you know, deport all the white people, send them no. all back to Sweden or, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't yeah. think I've ever heard that. Uh, no. but yeah, but yeah, a little, little ridiculous. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of people are right when they say that that knee jerk comes from assuming that oppressed peoples want to do to white people, what white people have historically done to oppressed peoples. Right. And, it's uh, still kind of a racialized fear in a lot of ways. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It really exposes a lot of, uh, white supremacist mentalities are still around and, and I get how they might have that knee jerk. But they expose a lot about themselves <laughs> when they when they say that, you when know, they, when, yeah, they, have when they say it out loud. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But well, I think uh, I think we're at our, at our time limit here. Mm -hmm. um, before we go, do you want to plug all your stuff? Yeah, uh, I run the YouTube channel Anarch, A-N-A-R-K. Uh, I do, I do, I do YouTube video essays, which are really just painfully long at this point. Uh, about <laughs> anarchism and libertarian socialism. They're not only about theory. I also make videos that are about praxis and about the overall strategic goals of a revolutionary movement. Um, 
And uh, I also have a Patreon. If you end up liking my work, please go give me some money because this is actually uh, like I, I have two jobs and one of them is the YouTube channel. So it'd be awesome if I actually had people to give me a little yeah. bit of uh, a little bit of pay here. But uh, but yeah, that's about it. I'm on Twitter uh, and that is uh, Anarch YouTube on Twitter. Uh, and yeah, the, the Twitter also, I, I just I fight with authoritarian leftists all day. If that sounds entertaining, <laughs> if you want to see me, if you want to see me argue with authoritarian leftists a lot, great place to go. Right. Yeah. Get told you don't know what you're talking about all day long. <laughs> I'm an idealist anarchity who just needs to learn the immortal science of dialectical materialism. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, well, you don't look like a kid to me. So. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I'm I'm old at this point. I'm 36, so now I'm officially an old. I think is how that works. Well, you're you're still eight years younger than I am, so <laughs> you got a long ways to go. Oh well, sorry to say that. I don't know what that has to say about you, but you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, no. And it always makes me laugh when I see somebody say, yeah, say "anarchity" because mm-hmm. I'm just like, you know, I've I've got an 18 year old son. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting stereotype because it's backwards of what most of what I've seen is, which is that yeah. the more people organize, the more they read, the more they come to a libertarian socialist perspective over time. For sure. But yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. I was glad to come on here. I'm sorry I didn't have more time. You know, we were just a little behind schedule here. I'd, I'd be happy to come on and have a much longer conversation at some time in the future. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or RateMyPodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist Humanist Leftist Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves.